The following program is a co-production of the Nebraska ETV Network and UNO Television with funding provided by the Nebraska Humanities Council. Burning, looting, rioting. Those seem to be the facts of life during the 1960s. Black neighborhoods throughout the northern and western United States burned. In Omaha, Nebraska, the black community was centered around North 24th Street, the near north side. It burned as well. The rioting robbed this community of its commercial vitality, its charisma, its very spirit. But it wasn't always like that. There was nothing but businesses out here, when you come to think about it. Everybody went down there, you met your friends, and they brought their children, and uh, holidays, and beautiful memories. 24th Street was a viable thoroughfare, full of businesses, side by side. But there were small mom and papa businesses. There were numerous hardware stores, grocery stores, pawn shops, whatever you needed was right there. Plus, the charm of that black community, the beer taverns and the clubs, lots of live music. This is North 24th Street today. Folks don't even venture down here much anymore. The stores are gone and so are the people. For those who come here, the fear of drive-bys and muggings are always in the back of their minds. There are many reasons why this lively thoroughfare deteriorated and it didn't happen overnight. However, the memory of it lives on in the hearts of those who once called this home. They know what North 24th Street was and hope that it may become again a street of dreams. Saturday, July 31st, and North 24th Street comes alive. Thousands come together to take part in the Native Omaha celebration held every two years. They transform this desolate stretch of roadway back into a lively community. come from all over the country to celebrate. But what is it about this neighborhood that draws so many of them back? We left in 1950, and as you did better, you moved out. And I think that made a difference. But we never forgot where we came from. Located just north of downtown Omaha, the near north side has always been a working class neighborhood. One ethnic group after another came and left in the search of a piece of the American dream. In the 1880s, North Omaha became home to the Irish, Scandinavians, and Germans who found work in this rapidly expanding section of the city. 
By the early 1900s, the Italians lived here, as did Jews from Eastern Europe. Jews opened up businesses along North 24th and remained in the neighborhood for many years. By 1910, black families began arriving on North 24th Street, pursuing their dreams. Most were coming from southern states. In the south, the cotton industry was failing. The boll weevil and a series of droughts ravaged crops. Rural families found it difficult to make ends meet. Segregation, lack of jobs, and discontentment caused many to look elsewhere for a better life. With World War I raging in Europe, millions of American men went off to fight, and they left behind their jobs. Northern industries scrambled to fill those jobs and looked south for available manpower. In response to this call, a great mass of black families made the journey north in search of a better life. like most northern communities, became the promised land for those seeking jobs and prosperity. Determined and optimistic, they came. A flood of relatives and friends followed in their wake. Or, as in the case of Pilgrim Baptist Church, where much of one congregation from a small town in Alabama up and moved north. Between 1910 and 1920, the African-American population in Omaha had more than doubled. They came here for jobs, better opportunities, job opportunities. The packing house was a big lure for people because it was a job and it was a good paying job. Even at uh, 40 cents an hour, whatever they were making in those, back in those times was, was much, much better than, than what you were making wherever they came from. Paul Allen's family was just one of many that migrated to Omaha. The year was 1922. My father was a minister and he went to college at Hart Springs, Arkansas, a theological seminary. And he was ordained as a Methodist. And his cousin moved to Omaha, Nebraska earlier. Then he sent back for my father to come out and run a revival. And uh, he was articulate and, and a good speaker, and he knew the Bible, and, and, and he was tall at that time. It was a tall time, and he went over real big, so he, he thought he would move here. I said, well, I, I like Omaha. My mother came and looked it over, and so we moved to Omaha. Omaha was the major recipient of migrants, and that is because there was a concerted effort between the large packing plants. Omaha was home to four of the five major uh, meat packers at the time, Wilson, Armour, Swift, and Cudahy. And those packing plants, of course, had contracts for government rations to feed people and the troops, you see. And they not only needed the regular workforce, but even an enlarged one. Well, they got together with the railroads, and they induced, you see, enticed uh, a mass migration. Many new arrivals found city life very much to their liking. The schools were better. Blacks could vote. You didn't have to step off the sidewalk to let a white person pass. And a colored man could have a stake in something. There was room to maneuver, and Negroes could come and go as they pleased. You had a little more freedom. You feel a little freer here. They know they weren't going to railroad you as fast as they would in Arkansas. Blacks settled in, hoping for their chance at the American dream. However, they could only find low-skilled, low-paying jobs. They worked hard, lived modestly, and had close-knit families. Bertha Moore was a child then. She grew up in a large family with 10 brothers and sisters. And although her parents had little beyond the bare necessities to offer them, Mrs. Moore remembers those years with great fondness. We made do with what we had. We didn't have bicycles or we didn't have anything like that. We had paper dolls and 
But we never had the abundance that the children have now. And sometimes maybe we were better off. I, it, I didn't seem to hurt me. We lived a normal life and grew up and had our children. I remember though that um, Mama always had a garden and chickens and um, she made our clothes and she um, would do a lot of canning and baking and you could smell that bread. I, I think I can smell it now, really. Negroes were not alone in their pursuit for a better life for themselves. Jewish immigrants were already well established along North 24th and had been for decades. Many of Eastern European descent, they fled their homelands where they were discouraged from practicing their religion, forbidden to own land, and were a constant target of anti-Semitism. Omaha was a good place to settle in. They formed a tight-knit community. Some even came from the same area. The congregation B'nai Jacob was made up mainly of people from one small town in Lithuania. There was religious freedom, and uh, they had a chance to be like anybody else. I mean, they weren't going to be oppressed. That the whole thing is I think they ran away was from oppression. I mean, they, they from time immemorial, maybe it was always, somebody was always out to kill the Jews. Nate Schuchert grew up along North 24th Street. My father came to the United States in 1907. He was married in Europe, and uh, his wife passed away. And my mother had been married too, and she had one son. And uh, I don't know whatever happened to her first husband, but anyhow, they got, they got together, matchmaker, matchmaker, make me a match, you know. And they got together, and uh, out of this great happiness, I came along. <laughs> Jews carved a niche for themselves along this busy thoroughfare. By the early 1900s, the street was known as Omaha's Jewish Miracle Mile. Thriving businesses of all kinds flourished. They catered to the ethnic taste and spending habits of the many nationalities that lived and worked in North Omaha. At one time, there was about eight kosher meat markets. There was probably two or three bakeries. There was two delicatessens. There was a bunch of little grocery stores. There were two or three fish markets, shoe stores, clothing stores, hardware stores. I mean, it was uh, from 24th Street, from Cumming to Lake. I mean, it was a busy bee. Some had horse and wagons, and some had cars, and, had, and I'll tell you, everybody used to come. You'd come to 24th Street, they go to the bakery, then they'd go to the meat market, you know, and they'd go to the grocery store, and they'd go to the fish market, and everybody was involved in it. I mean, you know, blacks, whites, green, didn't make any difference. I mean, we were all, we were friends. I mean, you know, you could, you could be mad, you could fight one minute and kiss the next minute. I mean, it was just, and we all felt that. We all just kind of belonged. It was just a, a family situation. There wasn't any blacks or whites. It was all there together. We never thought nothing about that. We all played out there together, and um, I don't think that race bothered me or I ever thought much of it as a child. I remember that um, the people that lived just around the corner were white. The people who lived over there was white. The people that lived up there. Mrs. Moore has fond memories of her youth but that was not always the reality for Negroes in Omaha or the nation as a whole. The end of World War I brought on a lot of change. The enlisted men were returning home. Government spending on arms was winding down. Competition for work became fierce. For the first time, whites had to compete with blacks for jobs. Whites turned their anger and frustration on black neighborhoods, spreading terror and fear nationwide. Many were killed. The year was 1919, and it was the bloodiest summer ever between the races. Omaha was not spared its measure of violence. That September, a white woman, 
Agnes Lobeck, accused a black packing house worker, Will Brown, of rape. He was arrested, held and questioned by police in the Douglas County Jail. Out on the street, a mob of angry men demanded Brown be handed over to them. The police refused. The mob then set fire to the jail. As officers battled the flames, the mob stormed in and drug Brown out to the street below. By now, the mob had grown to several thousand. Omaha Mayor Ed Smith tried to stop them, but the vigilantes turned their rage on him. The mayor narrowly escaped being lynched and was cut down in time to save his life. Brown was not so lucky. He was shot hundreds of times. Then his body was hung from a light pole. The body was dragged through the streets of downtown Omaha. Finally, it was torched and burned. By morning, the city was placed under martial law. Troops were posted along the streets to prevent further outbreaks of violence. The riot was confined to the courthouse and parts of downtown. However, its impact extended deep into the black community. And I remember the humiliation. I remember that I was ashamed. I can remember the fear among the people of the North, and it was a fear for all of us. There wasn't too many of the black children in the high school at that time, so for a couple of days, most of us stayed away. We were very ashamed, very ashamed. Why were you ashamed? Well, I, you know, when you're 14, uh, when things like that kind of shock you, and uh, you can't believe this, that they can do anything. And then it kind of strikes you for maybe the first time that um, because your color, that that kind of does something to you. That, that kind of does something to you. Uh -huh. It always did, and it, it always has, and still does. Over the next several decades, personal attacks against Negroes became more subtle and institutional in nature. As the black population doubled, their presence could no longer be ignored by the white community. In the 1920s, the practice of segregation intensified. Restrictive real estate covenants, ironically known as gentlemen's agreements, became a powerful tool used to keep blacks from moving out of Omaha's near north side. Race restrictive covenants really started against the Asians in California in the 1890s, but were a method of, of not only keeping Asians, but also blacks in areas throughout the 1910s and especially in the 20s and 30s. A legal instrument that really, that really kept uh, basically the Jim Crow laws from the South enacted into the, into the North, which in the real estate practice really said that blacks shall live in this area because when houses were available for rent, they would be available and open only to blacks. And it says in the newspaper literature, whites only, coloreds only, or in some very definite degree. And that was then borne by the race restrictive covenants in, in what was effect law. It lasted for a very long time and really had a very pervasive impact to segregate the black population between 1920 and um, the mid-1930s, uh, almost all blacks were concentrated in this area by rental policies, bank loan policies, insurance uh, policies, that is, refusal to insure blacks outside of an area and so forth. Um, it's uh, called redlining. And um, 
uh, what happened then was the creation of a black ghetto. Now, it's not 100% black. It's just a walled area, and this is where blacks are forced to live. This isolation was an important factor in developing a strong black presence along North 24th. Negroes increasingly established their own businesses, beauty shops, barber shops, cafes, and other small businesses prospered. They created their own entertainment, even a miniature golf course, the latest pastime, found its way onto North 24th. Blacks could relax and feel comfortable with their families. And black undertakers replaced white morticians who no longer offered their services to Negroes. There were several newspapers over the years. The Omaha Star, first published in the 30s, emerged as a lasting voice of the neighborhood. Many young boys got their first job there. A new class of doctors, lawyers, dentists, and other professionals emerged and located their offices along North 24th. They bought expensive furniture, fine china, sent their children away to college, and held conservative views. Rejected by the world outside North 24th, they created their own, often mimicking white society's customs and rituals. Clubs reached their zenith during this period. Most were linked to some kind of charitable activity. They raised money, held recitals and teas, and sponsored elaborate affairs like this one, fashioned after the pageantry of the Exarban coronation. In spite of this, blacks were unable to establish a viable economic power base. Other ethnic groups continued to dominate the major business activity along North 24th. Clearly, the standout attraction along North 24th Street was its celebrated nightlife, and it would be fitting and appropriate that North Omaha's prime night spot was a ballroom called the Dreamland. The Dreamland was the legend. Ooh, the Dreamland, because every major important black attraction of my time played the, the Dreamland. Preston Love played countless engagements on the Dreamland stage over the years. His dream was to play with the number one band of the day, the Count Basie Orchestra. He auditioned for the Count and won a chair with the band on that very stage. He was just 22 years old. Everything else that occurs in my life will be anticlimactic because I realized my dream because I worshiped the Basie band and his style, and more especially Earl Warren, the first saxophonist. And as fate was, would have it, I replaced him and the band. If you can think of any bands, if you go back in the history book, they played the Dreamer. Louis Armstrong played there, Louis Jordan, Duke Ellington, all of the big guys. Paul Allen was a successful nightclub owner and promoter for many years. Jimmy Jewell, the owner, used to book dances there. He could put on a good attraction and be sure of having enough people. They'd have five, 600 people. 400 people could support it. 500 was a little heavy for the, for the dance hall, you know. The floor might give in. was the home base for several popular bands. Local trumpeter, Red Perkins, led one of Omaha's first great bands, the Dixie Ramblers. Versatile and talented, Perkins traveled the region for close to 20 years. A contemporary of Red's, Lloyd Hunter and the Hunter Serenaders, enjoyed considerable success also. They played dance halls all over the Midwest and even enjoyed national recognition for a time. An excellent musician, he maintained a small combo until his death in the early 1960s. Then came the great Nat Tolls out of the Southwest and located here because of all the good bookings. That was a great band. 
proof of that is who did those guys go with? Most of his personnel. Most of them ended up with Ellington, Basie, Jamie Lunsford, the big bands of the East. A local celebrity, Anna Mae Winburn, became the leader of the number one female band in the 1940s, the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. She once fronted Lloyd Hunter's serenaders from Omaha. Beautiful and sophisticated, she led the Sweethearts to great success and popularity. A grand lady, a lovable woman. Down to earth as you could be, but a lot of class. Very beautiful physically. Looked like something out of a book, out of a magazine. And those little raggedy ballrooms you'd play in the Midwest, out in cornfields and stuff. And this beautiful lady in these gowns and these robes. Heck of a band. And they could play. They weren't just jiving. Some of them guys could blow that lead trumpet. It was tough. She'd make a lot of guys look, you know, be together around the bandstand. You could hear the comments. She'd make the guys stand up and take notice. At 72, Love is still active, playing and lecturing. Here with sons, Richie and Norman, they rehearse for their soon-to-be-released CD. In the early days, the 20s, 30s, and 40s of black existence in this town, we didn't have economic strength or power, but we were totally a separate society then. We were forced into it, and we had a degree of unity and, and oneness of purpose, especially in our art. Blues, rhythm and blues, jazz. I get a sinking sensation. I wish I could explain it. This was once a thriving beehive of activity every day. It's crushing to see what has happened to my city, what's happened to my home. It is crushing to see the black community with all these vacant lots and these buildings are run down and dilapidated and houses falling over and others torn down. It is devastating. The heydays of North 24th Street are only a memory now. However, its spirit comes alive again in those attending the native Omahaan reunion. People have traveled from across the country to see old friends. They laugh, dance, and remember. And for one night, it's like nothing has changed. This is my hometown. This, this town nurtured me, educated me, and where the best friends you've ever made are here, your childhood friends. So I must come back every two years at the biennial homecoming. And then, of course, I have to see my mom. I came back so I can be here for Omaha days because I missed it. And I wanted to see a lot of people I haven't seen in 22 years, you know? And, uh, and of course, uh, all the people who touched my life while I was here. Going to college, coming from Jersey, there were a lot of hungry nights. There were a lot of people who fed me here, you know, and, uh, and took care of me, you know, and I'm grateful for that. Most of my memories of Omaha are fond, even the ones that in the public perception might uh, be perceived to be otherwise. Uh, we had a lot of uh, conflicts here in Omaha involving uh, primarily institutional racism. In America, to be poor and to be black is the consequence of hundreds of years, and we didn't get to this point yesterday. It's been a long continuum over a uh, few hundred years, and it's not possible to see where we are until we understand how we got here. The 1940s saw the end of the Depression and another significant increase in the number of blacks migrating north. In one of six giant assembly plants strung across the North American continent, 
Workers complete the building of B-29 super fortresses. Bomber plants were built in Omaha and other cities. Southern blacks again streamed in looking for work in the defense industry. With the victory against Hitler won in Europe, Negroes hoped for a second victory against racism at home. World War II was the single most important generator of the civil rights movement. And during World War II, uh, African-American leadership, the African-American press especially, uh, organized what was called the Double V Campaign. Victory abroad, but also victory at home. That is, uh, African-Americans did not want to repeat the World War I experience, uh, become doughboys, fight for your country, come home, and then uh, not be rewarded, as a matter of fact, even be punished. When they went and saw the world outside of North 24th Street, they started to get educated. And sometimes education changes things too, because then they came back, you know, and they said, oh, whoa, wait a minute here, you know. As the country changed, so did the face of North 24th. No longer the home of several ethnic groups, it was now almost entirely African-American. Most Jews left when the hard times ended. During the Depression, people stayed where they were. But when the Depression was over and people started making more money, then they started moving into different neighborhoods. And uh, some of the old timers that had the stores on 24th Street that passed away. And uh, either their kids didn't want their businesses anymore, and uh, they would close down. You know, and they would move away. 24th Street had always been a place where people got started and then moved on. Other immigrants could change their names, drop their accents, and in this way, lose themselves in society. Blacks could not. They could not change the color of their skin. Homes outside the near north side would not be available to Negroes for another 20 years. The problem was to get the damn wall knocked down that was holding people physically, mentally, all the way locked in this terrible system uh, that racism had built. Uh, and it was the Omaha's near north side. And so we turned our efforts uh, to what some people, I suppose, would use the word more militant. Denny Holland was a young college student from Kansas who came to Omaha to attend Creighton University. While there, he joined a racially mixed group of students who began confronting racism head on. They called themselves the DePores Club. Our first business that we went and talked to about hiring a black person it was a laundry located on 24th and Lake, had almost nothing but black customers. And we were astounded when the people in the neighborhood told us that they wouldn't hire a black clerk to work on to to work at the counter and they told us that yes they would not that was our first boycott we urged people not to do business there until they would hire a clerk and they did beginning in 1947 the club organized sit-ins boycotts and other forms of social protest one of the club's major battles involved the omaha and council bluff street railway company the company had a history of not hiring black drivers. It wasn't hidden in those days if people bluntly said, no, we won't hire you because you're black. So we went to the president, and he explained to us that if they hired a black person, if they had a black man operating a streetcar, when it came to the end of the run, if there was a white woman on there, of course, you know he'd rape her. And this was the president of a large... Uh, business establishment in, in Omaha. The club distributed thousands of leaflets all over the city. They urged people to protest by not riding the buses. But if you must ride, they said, show your objection by filling the coin box with pennies. It took three years and a referendum but the people of Omaha eventually voted in another franchise that hired black drivers. 
The club established a community center along North 24th Street. They distributed clothes and food to the needy. They held Christmas parties for the children of the neighborhood, and they put on plays, followed by discussions related to local issues. As a result of the DePores Club's efforts, blacks found work in greater numbers. Public places that had been closed to them for years were finally opened. The club was active for nearly a decade and established branches in Denver and Kansas City. But it was a struggle. It's like you're going up a mountain and you've got a great big semi, all the tires are flat, you're the only one pushing, and everybody comes by and says, don't go too fast. The problem isn't going too fast. The problem is, can you move the damn thing? And so one got to see that the don't go too fast, what that inferred is don't change anything. This nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. But no one could have predicted the phenomenal change about to occur in the coming decade. In the early 1960s, the push for racial justice took a new form. Large-scale, nonviolent, direct action was being used successfully throughout the South. And local activists decided it was time to try that approach in Omaha. In Omaha, barriers to jobs and housing continued. To confront this problem, a new group was formed, the Citizens Coordinating Committee for Civil Liberties, or the 4CL. They mobilized large numbers of people to demonstrate for fair employment and open occupancy in housing. Reverend R. F. Jenkins was the group's president. Many of our people didn't have decent housing. They found themselves uh, in rundown shacks, many of them, and some that did have better places they were not satisfied with what they had, some of them. And so they, many of them wanted to move to different sections of the city where the houses perhaps were in a fair shape, a better shape than some of the houses here. But under the Constitution, we become political and social entities standing upon common, common grounds. The Reverend Kelsey Jones and Reverend Rudolph McNair were the driving forces behind the 4CL. In the summer of 1963, the 4CL presented a list of grievances to Mayor James Dvorak. The mayor stalled and asked for more time to confer with other civic and business leaders. A biracial committee of 58 was formed to address those grievances. For the 4CL, this was just another delay. They moved ahead with their plans. A demonstration was held outside City Hall, led by Reverend McNair. I still believe when you want to kill something, simply draw up a committee and put enough people on it and it'll die. The committee is too large to be uh, an effective one. We want the things we feel we deserve and we want them now. We are not asking for something. We feel that uh, there is something that has been denied us that we should have and that we are insistent upon getting, that we get it now. I considered him an irresponsible leader and he would not be able to serve on the committee and that he would have no voice with my office in the future. In the coming months, the mayor's biracial committee accomplished little in the way of meaningful progress. So, in the summer of 1963, the 4CL picketed city council chambers demanding jobs and open housing. The council tried to ignore the demonstrators and conduct business as usual. Many were arrested. Their charge? Disturbing the peace.
With no new jobs or housing ordinances coming out of city council, the 4CL called for an even larger demonstration. Our next demonstration was at the courthouse. We sent uh, messages to people all over the city and told them what was going to happen the next day. There were the packing house people that thought they would like to uh, join us. So they hired a big bus and came to uh, the courthouse. And there were other people that came in and drove from other sections of the city. So there must have been 2,000 or more people present in the corridors and outside of the courthouse. First, we had a prayer-in. I think I led that prayer-in. And after that, we went out and we demonstrated. And there were people that came by and didn't like what we were doing. I remember one dear lady that had an umbrella. She came by and would poke us with the umbrella as she would pass by. But we continued to go on. We forgave her. We know she didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. This is the Salem Baptist Church, one of the largest churches in this community. Members of this and other congregations come from all over the city to attend services here in North Omaha. Down through the years, the church has helped the people withstand overwhelming odds through difficult times. In the 1960s, the church provided much of the spiritual motivation behind the civil rights movement. In response, thousands put their jobs, reputation, and literally their bodies on the line for equal opportunity under the law. You're dealing with uh, two of the most sensitive, personal, and most important personal decisions of people's lives. Who gets the job? Who gets to buy this house and live next door to me? And within that milieu of the 60s, even with uh, the amount of liberal attitude that existed then, it was very, very difficult uh, to get that. And uh, in, in Omaha and Nebraska, uh, it proved to be impossible. Now, were they effective? The goals of the local civil rights movement was to get the Omaha City Council and or the legislature, the unicameral, the state of Nebraska, to pass an open housing ordinance and a fair employment ordinance, neither of which was ever done. That did not come, of course, until the national statutes. But in terms of energizing uh, the black community, in bringing these issues before the media and getting the coverage and awakening white Omaha to the situation and building pride in black Omaha to push these kinds of issues, they were successful. President Johnson addresses a joint session of Congress to push a voting rights bill aimed at ending discrimination. In the mid-60s, Congress led the way by enacting landmark civil rights laws. Also included were the Equal Employment Act and open housing legislation. But progress was not always evident to those who needed a job and a place to live. The war in Vietnam diverted national attention and money away from civil rights and social programs. At the same time, the nonviolent strategies of several years earlier were put aside. Black power and black is beautiful now took root in a new generation of African Americans impatient for change. Anger and frustration exploded in a devastating cycle of looting, burning, and death nationwide. 1966 through 1969 were tense and turbulent years on Omaha's near north side. Several encounters between residents and police escalated into violence. One of the worst occurred in 1968 during a visit by former governor of Alabama, George Wallace, who at the time was making a run for the presidency. George Wallace was really downgrading us, you know. And we didn't like that. And there were a number of young people there that especially didn't like it. So 
they began to throw little placards that they had up on the stage. And Wallace played like those things were about to kill him. They're about to hit him. And so he hollered for the police to come. Well, the police came and they called themselves trying to make the children stop or take them outside. And then they decided they wanted to arrest some. But the children said, no, you're not going to arrest us. So they began to run. And they ran back out north, down 24th Street especially. And after they ran for a distance, they thought of something. We should stop running and do something about this. So they did. They decided to start, not run, but burn. And they began to set fires. And they burnt to various uh, establishments up and down 24th Street. And that was, uh, it burned way up into the night. The turmoil spread up North 24th Street. A teenager was shot dead inside a pawn shop. The killing triggered several nights of burning and looting. The street of dreams had become a nightmare. I went down and it was about three o'clock in the morning and the fires were going and everything. You could see it. I figured uh, maybe it was necessary. I hated to see him have to use that particular way to get that, uh, to get something done. Being not a violent person myself, it's hard for me to conceive why you're going to torch and burn up something, you know? Uh, because uh, if you want your community, you're not community-minded. If you want your community to prosper, they, you would want to kind of help it, wouldn't you? You wouldn't want to destroy it. And if you knew it to be the beautiful part that I knew, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Those people weren't burning up their community, nor businesses, because in the first place they didn't have any. Those, those businesses belonged to other people. They would come in there in the morning and sell and stay all day and sell to our people and leave in the afternoon or night and come back the next day and do the same thing. So they weren't really burning up their community. They were burning up somebody else's. I think it kind of had to happen that way. Change doesn't come smoothly usually. Change, change only comes, it seems to me, with, with a threat or with, with uh, a bit of violence. But what change? And at what cost? The riots proved to be a bust for the economic vitality of North 24th Street. The number of businesses there dropped dramatically. Shop owners either moved or closed up for good, and there were no black businesses to fill that void. Omaha never really had the local base of black shop owners, businessmen, the, in its community that perhaps other communities have had. So that when the changes occurred in the 60s and then into the 70s and 80s, there really was a, a, a total devastation of black support in terms of social services, retail, and other commercial ventures. The construction of the North Freeway deteriorated the neighborhood even further. In total disregard for the community, hundreds of homes were demolished to make way for the highway. In the 20-year period to follow, the number of people living in the near north side dropped nearly two-thirds. Just as Migration in built this neighborhood, Migration out devastated it. The Omaha Day festivities are just about over now. Like another piece? Yeah, like baked beans. Yes. For the last five days, those who once lived here and those who still live here celebrate the old neighborhood. And their children would likely continue the tradition. This picnic is the last chance many will have to get together and remember until the next time. Has Omaha changed? 
Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, you? Yeah. Yeah, for, yeah, for the worst. For the worst. <laughs> you know what? And we right. The house I was born at is a vacant lot with weeds growing up all in it. And I thought my grandfather's house was a showcase. Right on Bennett, and it ain't there no more. And you look all across the street, weeds. They, why don't they fix up North Omaha? Tell me that. Now they bomb it out, it looks like a crater down there. And it, 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 it's really, and that was our running ground, our stamping ground. I was born during the Depression. I came here. Things were beautiful, although we didn't have much. We didn't have much, but we had each other, which is the greatest thing to, in, in, the, in the world, is togetherness. We had churches, schools, you had the PTA, you had your neighbors, and wherever you went, somebody was watching you. And they were gonna tell your mother. And if you knew if your mother found out, she was gonna get you. <laughs> It takes the whole village to raise a child. You know, the this, this sense of, of neighbor and the sense of neighborhood and, and the whole connection, uh, there's been some severing of that uh, over the years and, and, you know, societal pressures on families and, and, and all of that certainly have attributed to that, but we need to reverse that. We need to get back to embracing that concept of community and that everyone has a stake in the well-being of everyone else who lives in the community. Brenda Council made the choice to remain in North Omaha. She represents this community on the Omaha City Council. When we were growing up in North Omaha, we were everyone's child. I mean, we don't know our neighbors. So, I mean, it's really hard to discipline, you know, the, the, the child next door when you don't even know the parents of the child next door. In all candor, it's not the community that it once was, but it certainly has the potential. We need to rejuvenate the community, make it the vibrant community that it was when I was a youngster. We need to retain and attract middle to upper middle income African Americans. Many people then and even now still want to live in the old neighborhood. The problem with the old neighborhood now is it's deteriorated. There has been very little investment inside of North Omaha. And Mike Maroney is president of the new Community Development Corporation that built Anatol an apartment complex along Florence Boulevard. We took the rental route primarily because we thought we could have a greater impact on more people in a shorter period of time. And there are a lot of people out there who don't want to own it this time, but just really want a decent, safe, and an affordable place uh, to live. And we found that there are a number of people uh, in that position. In fact, when we did our last project, we had 10 applications for each unit. But we knew in order to begin to turn that neighborhood around, we had to make a statement in the impact. If we can make a big enough impact in that particular area, we think that people will come back on their own. It not only takes people to revive a community, it takes money too. Banks and other lenders, as a matter of practice, still make few loans in the area. Maroney had a hard time finding capital for the Anatol apartments. So he and others are working to make the community financially self-sufficient. The credit union was developed to fill a void in the community. We have a financial institution that has the capability of doing anything any bank in the city could do if it has sufficient capital. And with 50,000 African Americans in this community, just a small portion of their savings on an annual basis would allow the credit union to begin to do the very kinds of things that we criticize other financial institutions for not doing. And I think it's just a matter of us realizing that by pooling our resources and then utilizing it to our benefit, it's what everybody else does. We're probably the one group of people who have yet to really understand uh, that process. A neighborhood is more than a collection of houses. A neighborhood is made up of the dreams and aspirations of the people who live there. And in the long run, it will be the people who will decide the course their neighborhood will take. 30 years ago, they were talking about urban renewal, and back then we all knew what that meant. That meant Negro removal. And we were very vocal about that. But now when we talk about making some wholesale changes in the community, it's not a situation where they are coming in talking about what they're going to do to us, but it's more of a partnership of what we're all going to do together to affect change. 
I hope our people will see that they need to work with each other. I like to see religious groups work together, especially one thing, like the Habitat for Humanities. I think that's a very good thing. Can you imagine? We could have a Roman Catholic priest here who says on his name tag, Lutheran Catholic Coalition. <laughs> Parishioners from three different faiths gather here to build low-income housing as part of the Habitat for Humanities project. Rabbi Azriel. The pulpit of God is here, guys. It's not where the bricks and mortar is. And it's time for us clergy to realize by being here a whole yeah. week that this is where God wants us to worship. And you guys helped us to do it. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think many of us, though, who came up in the 60s or the 50s or the 70s, who were recipients of scholarships that our parents and our grandparents struggled you know, to get so they could go to school, or who fought those battles so that we could obtain some of those jobs, or who, who marched so that we could live anywhere we wanted to, I think those who are recipients of that have a responsibility uh, to give something back uh, to the community so that others may also benefit. Traditionally, we move on in the pursuit of the American dream. The promised land has always been just over the horizon. But that pursuit comes with a price when a neighborhood is abandoned by the very people who made it vital and prosperous. That's been the history of North 24th. Assimilation into other communities, integration into other communities is not necessarily the answer. To move to 120th and Goo -ba -goo in South in South Omaha or West Omaha is not necessarily the answer. We have a culture that should be preserved with pride and love. And much of that comes from that barbershop, that pool hall, that bar, and what existed in the black community.